THE ASCENT OF MOUNT CARMEL BY ST. JOHN OF THE CROSS BOOK THREE, CHAPTER Twenty Four, WHICH TREATS OF THE THIRD KIND OF GOOD THING WHEREON THE WILL MAY SET THE AFFECTION OF REJOICING, WHICH KIND PERTAINS TO SENSE, INDICATES WHAT THESE GOOD THINGS ARE, AND OF HOW MANY KINDS, AND HOW THE WILL HAS TO BE DIRECTED TO GOD, AND PURGED OF THIS REJOICING. We have next to treat of rejoicing with respect to the good things of sense, which is the third kind of good thing wherein we said that the will may rejoice. And it is to be noted that by the good things of sense we here understand everything in this life that can be apprehended by the senses of sight, hearing, smell, taste, or touch, and by the interior fashioning of imaginary reflections all of which things belong to the bodily senses, interior and exterior. And in order to darken the will and purge it of rejoicing with respect to these sensible objects, and direct it to God by means of them, it is necessary to assume one truth, which is that, as we have frequently said, the sense of the lower part of man, which is that whereof we are treating, is not, neither can be, capable of knowing or understanding God as God is, so that the eye cannot see him or anything that is like him, neither can the ear hear his voice or any sound that resembles it, neither can the sense of smell perceive a perfume as sweet as he, neither can the taste detect a savor so sublime and delectable, neither can the touch feel a movement so delicate and full of delight nor anything like to it. Neither can his form or any figure that represents him enter into the thought or imagination. Even as says Isaiah, Eye has not seen him, nor has ear heard him, neither has it entered into the heart of man. And here it must be noted that the senses may receive pleasure and delight either from the spirit by means of some communication that it receives from God interiorly, or from outward things communicated to them. And as has been said, neither by way of the spirit nor by that of sense can the sensual part of the soul know God. For since it has no capacity for attaining to such a point, it receives in the senses both that which is of the spirit and that which is of sense, and receives them in no other way. Wherefore it would be, at the least, nothing but vanity to set the rejoicing of the will upon pleasure caused by any of these apprehensions, and it would be hindering the power of the will from occupying itself with God, and from setting its rejoicing upon Him alone. This the soul cannot perfectly accomplish, save by purging itself, and remaining in darkness as to rejoicing of this kind, as also with respect to other things. I said advisedly that if the rejoicing of the will were to rest in any of these things, it would be vanity. But when it does not rest upon them, but as soon as the will finds pleasure in that which it hears, sees, and does, soars upward to rejoice in God, so that its pleasure acts as a motive and strengthens it to that end, this is very good. In such a case, not only need the said motions not be shunned when they cause this devotion and prayer, but the soul may profit by them, and indeed should so profit, to the end that it may accomplish this holy exercise. For there are souls who are greatly moved by objects of sense, to seek God. But much circumspection must be observed herein, and the resulting effects must be considered. For oftentimes many spiritual persons indulge in the recreations of sense aforementioned under the pretext of offering prayer and devotion to God. And they do this in a way which must be described as recreation rather than prayer, and which gives more pleasure to themselves than to God. And although the intention that they have is toward God, the effect which they produce is that of recreation of sense, wherein they find weakness and imperfection 
rather than revival of the will and surrender thereof to God. I wish, therefore, to propose a test whereby it may be seen when these delights of the senses aforementioned are profitable and when they are not. And it is that whensoever a person hears music and other things and sees pleasant things and is conscious of sweet perfumes or tastes things that are delicious or feels soft touches, if his thought and the affection of his will are at once centered upon God and if that thought of God gives him more pleasure than the movement of sense which causes it, and, save for that he finds no pleasure in the said movement, this is a sign that he is receiving benefit therefrom, and that this thing of sense is a help to his spirit. In this way such things may be used, for then such things of sense subserve the end for which God created and gave them, which is, that he should be the better loved and known because of them. And it must be known, furthermore, that one upon whom these things of sense cause the pure spiritual effect which I describe has no desire for them, and makes hardly any account of them, though they cause him great pleasure when they are offered to him, because of the pleasure which, as I have said, they cause him in God. He is not, however, solicitous for them, and when they are offered to him, as I say, his will passes from them at once, and he abandons it to God, and sets his will upon him. The reason why he cares little for these motives, though they help him on his journey to God, is that the spirit which is ready to go by every means and in every way to God is so completely nourished and prepared and satisfied by the Spirit of God that it lacks nothing and desires nothing. Or, if it desires anything to that end, the desire at once passes and is forgotten, and the soul makes no account of it. But one that feels not this liberty of spirit in these things and pleasures of sense, but whose will rests in these pleasures and feeds upon them, is greatly harmed by them, and should withdraw himself from the use of them. For although his reason may desire to employ them to journey to God, yet inasmuch as his desire finds pleasure in them which is according to sense, and their effect is ever dependent upon the pleasure which they give, he is certain to find hindrance in them rather than help, and harm rather than profit. And when he sees that the desire for such recreation reigns in him, he must mortify it. For the stronger it becomes, the more imperfection he will have, and the greater will be his weakness. So, whatever pleasure coming from sense presents itself to the spiritual person, and whether it come to him by chance or by design, he must make use of it only for God lifting up to God the rejoicing of his soul, so that his rejoicing may be useful and profitable and perfect, realizing that all rejoicing, which implies not renunciation and annihilation of every other kind of rejoicing, although it be with respect to something apparently very lofty, is vain and profits not, but is a hindrance towards the union of the will in God. Chapter 25 Which treats of the evils that afflict the soul when it desires to set the rejoicing of its will upon the good things of sense. In the first place, if the soul does not darken and quench the joy which may arise within it from the things of sense, and direct its rejoicing to God, all the general kinds of evil which we have described as arising from every other kind of rejoicing follow from this joy in the things of sense. Such evils are darkness of the reason, lukewarmness, spiritual re weariness, etc. But, to come to details, many are the evils, spiritual, bodily, and sensual, into which the soul may fall through this rejoicing. First of all, from joy in visible things. When the soul denies not itself therein, in order to reach God, there may come to it directly 
vanity of spirit and distraction of the mind, unruly covetousness, immodesty, outward and inward unseemliness, impurity of thought and envy. From joy in hearing useless things, there may directly arise distraction of the imagination, gossiping, envy, rash judgments, and vacillating thoughts, and from these arise many other and pernicious evils. From joy in sweet perfumes there arise loathing of the poor, which is contrary to the teaching of Christ, dislike of serving others, unruliness of heart in humble things, and spiritual insensibility, at least to a degree proportionate with its desire for this joy. From joy in the savor of meat and drink there arise directly such gluttony and drunkenness, wrath, discord and want of charity with one's neighbors and with the poor, as had that Epulon who fared sumptuously every day with Lazarus. Hence arise bodily disorders, infirmities, and evil motions, because the incentives to luxury become greater. Directly, too, there arises great spiritual torpor, and the desire for spiritual things is corrupted, so that the soul can derive no enjoyment or satisfaction from them, nor can even speak of them. From this joy is likewise born distraction of the other senses and of the heart, and discontent with respect to many things. From joy in the touch of soft things arise many more evils and more pernicious ones, which more quickly cause sense to overflow into spirit and quench all spiritual strength and vigor. Hence arises the abominable vice of effeminacy, or incentives thereto, according to the proportion of joy of this kind which experience is experienced. Hence luxury increases, the mind becomes effeminate and timid, and the senses grow soft and delicate, and are predisposed to sin and evil. Vain gladness and joy are infused into the heart. The tongue takes to itself license, and the eyes roam unrestrainedly, and the remaining senses are blunted and deadened, according to the measure of the desire. The judgment is put to confusion, being nourished by spiritual folly and insipidity, Moral cowardice and inconstancy increase, and by the darkness of the soul and the weakness of the heart, fear is begotten, even where no fear is. At times again, this joy begets a spirit of confusion and insensibility with respect to conscience and spirit, wherefore the reason is greatly enfeebled and is affected in such a way that it can neither take nor give good counsel and remains incapable of moral and spiritual blessings, and becomes as useless as a broken vessel. All these evils are caused by this kind of rejoicing, in some more intensely, according to the intensity of their rejoicing, and also according to the complacency or weakness or variableness of the person who yields to it. For there are natures that will receive more detriment from a slight occasion of sin than will others from a great one. Finally, from joy of this kind in touch, a person may fall into as many evils and perils as those which we have described as concerning the good things of nature. And since these have already been described, I do not detail them here. Neither do I describe many other evils wrought thus, such as a falling off in spiritual exercises and bodily penance, and lukewarmness, and lack of devotion in the use of the sacraments of penance and of the Eucharist. Chapter 26 Of the benefits that come to the soul from self-denial in rejoicing as to things of sense which benefits are spiritual and temporal. Marvelous are the benefits that the soul derives from self-denial in this rejoicing. Some of these are spiritual and others temporal. The first is that the soul, by restraining its rejoicing as to things of sense, 
is restored from the distraction into which it has fallen through excessive use of the senses, and is recollected in God. The spirituality and the virtues that it has acquired are preserved. Nay, they are increased, and increase continually. The second spiritual benefit, which comes from self-denial in rejoicing as to things of sense, is exceeding great. We may say with truth that that which was sensual becomes spiritual, and that which was animal becomes rational, and even that the soul is journeying from a human life to a portion which is angelical, and that instead of being temporal and human it becomes celestial and divine. For even as a man who seeks the pleasure of things of sense and sets his rejoicing upon them, neither merits nor deserves any other name than those which we have given him, that is, sensual, animal, temporal, etc., even so, when he exalts his rejoicing above these things of sense, he merits all those other names, to wit, spiritual, celestial, etc. And it is clear that this is true, for although the use of the senses and the power of sensuality are contrary, as the Apostle says, to the power and the exercises of spirituality, it follows that when the one kind of power is diminished and brought to an end, the other contrary kinds, the growth of which was hindered by the first kinds, are increased. And thus, when the spirit is perfected, which is the higher part of the soul and the part which has relations with God and receives his communications, the spirit merits all these attributes aforementioned, since it is perfected in the heavenly and spiritual gifts and blessings of God. Both of these things are proved by St. Paul, who calls the sensual man, namely the man who directs the exercise of his will solely to things of sense, the animal man who perceives not the things of God. But this other man, who lifts up his will to God, he calls the spiritual man, saying that this man penetrates and judges all things, even the deep things of God. Therefore the soul gains herein the marvelous benefit of a disposition well able to receive the blessings and spiritual gifts of God. The third benefit is that the pleasures and the rejoicing of the will in temporal matters are very greatly increased. For as the Savior says, they shall receive a hundredfold in this life. So that, if you deny yourself one joy, the Lord will give you a hundredfold in this life, both spiritually and temporally. And likewise, for one joy that you have in these things of sense, you shall have a hundredfold of affliction and misery. For the through the eye that is purged from the joys of sight, there comes to the soul a spiritual joy, directed to God in all things that are seen, whether divine or profane. Through the ear that is purged from the joy of hearing, there comes to the soul joy most spiritual a hundredfold, directed to God in all that it hears, whether divine or profane. Even so is it with all the other senses, when they are purged. For even as in the state of innocence, all that our first parents saw and said and ate in paradise furnished them with greater sweetness of contemplation, so that the sensual part of their nature might be duly subjected to or ordered by reason. Even so, the man whose senses are purged from all things of sense and made subject to the spirit receives in their very first motion the delight of delectable knowledge and contemplation of God. Wherefore, to him that is pure, all things, whether high or low, are an occasion of greater good and further purity, even as the man that is impure is apt to derive evil from things both high and low, because of his impurity. But he that conquers not the joy of desire will not enjoy the serenity of habitual rejoicing in God through his creatures and works. In the man that lives no more according to sense, all the operations of the sense senses and faculties 
are directed to divine contemplation. For as it is true in good philosophy that each thing operates according to its being and to the life that it lives, so it is clear beyond contradiction that if the soul lives a spiritual life, the animal life being mortified, it must be journeying straight to God, since all its spiritual actions and motions pertain to the life of the spirit. Hence it follows that such a man, being pure in heart, finds in all things a knowledge of God which is joyful and pleasant, chaste, pure, spiritual, glad, and loving. From what has been said, I deduce the following doctrine, namely, that until a man has succeeded in so habituating his senses to the purgation of the joys of sense, that from their first motion he is gaining the benefit aforementioned of directing all his powers to God, he must needs deny himself joy and pleasure with respect to these powers, so that he may withdraw his soul from the life of sense. He must fear that since he is not yet spiritual, he may chance, perchance derive from the practice of these things a pleasure and energy which is of sense rather than of spirit. That the energy which is of sense may predominate in all his actions, and that this may lead to an increase of sensuality and may sustain and nurture it. For as our Savior says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Let this be closely considered, for it is the truth. And let not him that has not yet mortified his pleasure in things of sense dare to make great use of the power and operation of sense with respect to them thinking that they will help him to become more spiritual. For the powers of the soul will increase the more without the intervention of these things of sense. That is, if it quench the joy and desire for them, rather than indulge its pleasure in them. There is no need to speak of the blessings of glory that in the life to come result from the renunciation of these joys. For apart from the fact that the bodily gifts of the life of glory, such as agility and clarity, will be much more excellent than in those souls who have not denied themselves, there will be an increase in the essential glory of the soul corresponding to its love of God, for whose sake it has renounced the things of sense aforementioned. For every momentary fleeting joy that has been renounced, as St. Paul says, there shall be laid up an exceeding weight of glory eternally. And I will not here recount the other benefits, whether moral, temporal, or spiritual, which result from this night of rejoicing, for they all are those that have already been described, and to a more eminent degree, since these joys that are renounced are more closely linked to the, nat to the natural man, and therefore he that renounces them acquires thereby a more intimate purity. End of chapter 26